question at the time. But it becomes also the richest spot at that moment in time to unravel questions that affect us all. So in this place, in this space, and it sounds, and, it's, and it has a feel and a smell that, that we've actually centered ourselves in this room. I'm, I'm assuming that that was what was happening before. Yes. That we were centering ourselves. And in your own metaphor, you were invited to do that here. It's important because it's not just an idea. It's about talking about lives. And so even if there are questions that you have, this is the place to address those questions because you've got those who are coming back first voice in terms of seeing and first voice also from having lived the experience and going back and forth to have to bring the message of the, of the, of the moment and the questions of oppression which we all address in our various ways this is one of the keystone questions of this day and that's why I'm, I'm really excited now because I was multitasking I'm glad that you told me because I wasn't looking at the clock I have to go to a couple more things and then sneak a chair in the back and I won't be disruptive because I, I have years of experience of sneaking into a class like don't draw anybody back from it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but usually uh, um, so, um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the report back uh, I will be back and I'll have to uh, borrow someone's notes for the first uh, 10 minutes of the class but I want to welcome all um, well, Welcome you to, to, to do the introductions. Welcome the three the three of you back. And because you'll be introduced, uh, I'm just sort of saying hello to them, but you'll get introductions of each of the, uh, the three, the, the two faculty members that we have here, and a, a New York activist that uh, we, <laughs> you've come to know extremely well, uh, and that we, uh, we all uh, appreciate. And we actually need to borrow a lot of his time for uh, what happens here in the solidarity. So, I'll be back in 10 minutes and I'll borrow some of these notes to get caught up and I uh, look forward to both the report back and folks actually opening themselves up to open to questions and things that are really deep and great level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Jolivet. I am an associate professor in American Indian Studies and the department chair and was asked to moderate today's uh, report pack and panel, and uh, I do so uh, with great pleasure. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's um, not a coincidence, right, that uh, American Indian Studies, Native Americans, indigenous populations, and Palestinian communities have a lot in common. Um, our struggles are uh, rooted in um, very similar ways, um, both in a historical context and in a contemporary context. Uh, in fact, our, uh, the Graduate Seminar in American Indian Studies, which I'm teaching this semester, we began um, the class by watching Edward Said's video on Orientalism. Um, similar questions, similar representations of um, Arab and Muslim communities um, have also been, they are, um, both framed um, and produced um, in very simplistic ways, not understanding the complexity and diversity of Arab and Muslim communities, um, nor uh, indigenous communities. And so I think of this afternoon, uh, the Dean Monteros, you talked about a report back, but I think of this even more than just a report back, a, um, you know, a teach-in, but even more so than that, the Cree scholar Sean Wilson talks about um, how we use research as a ceremonial process. If we think about research as ceremony, how does that change the way in which we actually engage um, with the people that we are working with? When we go to other communities, whether they are our own communities or others' um, communities, and so that the courage, I, I just, you know, for, on a personal note, would like to thank each of the presenters today um, and those who may not, who have gone on the delegation but may not be able to be here with us physically for um, making that effort to create those uh, really sacred bonds with other communities because it's important to, um, the survival, resistance um, of our communities, and also to tell those stories. And so I see today also as a ceremony and also as a teaching um, of key and important and critical questions. And so before I ask each of the panelists to do a brief introduction of themselves, because I don't have formal uh, comments that they might want me to read, um, just a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping. I don't know why people always use that term. It's actually kind of sexist or housekeeping. Um, a couple items to uh, keep in mind, right? Uh, things for us to think about, to, 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 to keep um, uh, respectful, right? Um, and I've, I've already sort of set this context that we are sort of in a ceremonial space today and thinking really about the importance of the words that each person will be sharing with you and the fact that they are sharing 
that you do that in kind. That when we say research is ceremony, that's a, it's a reciprocal process, right? Um, so I, first and foremost, please be respectful to our presenters. Um, we, we'll take some uh, time for questions and comments at the very end, but we will be limiting questions to one, one question per person. Uh, please limit your um, comments or questions to specific things in the presentation, um, not other questions that are unrelated, uh, and keep them to one minute as well, uh, right? So we know, right, we don't want folks to uh, go off on tangents, and so uh, just please remember to be respectful. Uh, additionally, we ask that there not be any uh, audio recording, either with cell phones or any other devices. Um, no, so no audio recording or video recording uh, or photography unless it was requested in advance by someone from the Ahmed program or one of the individual presenters today. Um, yeah, yeah, it's okay. This is okay. Yes, so yes, exactly. So if they've asked you or, yeah, yeah, and it's been clear that it's okay. All right, are there any um, questions or anything else you all like? All right, so at this time, did you guys have an order that you wanted to go in? Okay, so um, yes. we're going to start with Jaime. If you want to say a little bit about who you are, Jaime, too, first. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to really thank all of you for attending and being here with us at this time. I know it must be difficult for many people to be out. Maybe you can Okay. And my name is Jaime Berry. I'm actually from New York, although I come back here and forth. Hopefully, I'll make a transition to San Francisco. I'm not so sure about it, but I'm thinking about it. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful city. In any event, I'm from New York, a political activist, long time. Uh, first of all, uh, as a young uh, high school member of the Young Lords Party in New York, uh, which was uh, uh, symbolically representing the Puerto Rican community within the framework of that period, the Black Panther Party, uh, Brown Berets, that period when many of us became very active and started becoming aware of our history and or a lack of knowledge of our history. Uh, I also was of the Vietnam period. I refused to serve in the U.S. Army. I refused to go to Vietnam. And uh, luckily, I did not wind up in jail, but I was prepared. Uh, that's a long story. And uh, then from there, I've uh, been, for the last almost 38 years, a, a union organizer at different levels within different unions, having just retired recently, at least formally. And within that framework, always addressing not only the immediate question of bread and butter issues and rights and benefits and contracts, but also trying to raise the social awareness of our workers, making our union a more uh, progressive social arena, and addressing issues such as Palestine, or at least attempting to address the issues of Palestine. And I will speak about that a little later. So that uh, within that framework, I've been a political activist in Puerto Rican independence, the anti-war movement in different areas, and then of course I've also uh, have become very active and work and very active in the question of Palestine. Uh, now the delegation that we had was basically primarily uh, academic uh, scholars, as they will speak of, and myself as a social activist. It is it is not a unique delegation. It is a delegation of many delegations that have recently gone to Palestine and were going to Palestine over the years in different times with different frameworks, but especially now where the issue has become much more open in debate in the general mainstream. And therefore, that makes our delegation maybe a little more uh, focused. Now, I'd like to open up by quoting Martin Luther King. In 1967, Martin Luther King gave a presentation at the Riverside Church in New York on April 4th, 1967. And it was a very significant speech which hardly ever is referred to. You always hear about going to the mountainside, and, but they never mentioned this speech very rarely. And that's because he openly broke with the mainstream civil rights movement on the question of Vietnam. And he opposed the war and he condemned the war and he actually said, that the U.S. is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world. And for that, he was very much vilified in the press, even isolated for a period of time from within the, uh, the civil rights movement. And he, stuck to, he stayed to his guns, and he, and, he, and he took a very firm position. And he basically said, and I, I, I want to open up with this, that 
in regards to Vietnam, and you really should read the speech, that it, it, there comes a time when silence has to be broken. And that is exactly how I would like to frame our discussion today. Silence has to be broken on the question of Palestine. Many of us hear about it or we read about it here and there, but we don't get presented with the full complexities and contradictions and problems that are presented in this particular issue. That's why the delegation went to Palestine. It's a delegation of academics who went to study and to look and to view and to experience and to dialogue with a wide range of people in Palestine from all of the various components and aspects that are reflective of Palestine. We did not fail to touch base with any particular reality in Palestine. We talked and that we, first of all, we covered much of all, amazingly, in 11 days, we covered much of, of, of Palestine. East Jerusalem, Nablus, Hebron, Bethlehem, Nazareth, Haifa, Jerusalem, refugee camps, including even the Nega, which is in the south of, of, uh, of, of Palestine, which is with the Bedouins, um, the Bedouins who are the people who live in the land, uh, who are being removed as similar to the way native people were removed here. We've met with political parties, women associations, the lesbian and gay youth, and I'm speaking about Palestinians. University, academic individuals and institutions, NGOs, business representatives, legislative representatives, political prisoners of all the political realities that are reflected in Palestine. We met with religious figures, both Christian and Muslim. We met with legal experts, those who deal with the legal issues of occupation, land confiscation, house demolition, and all the various legal components that are reflected. We met with social workers who deal with the trauma and the psychological dimensions that are reflected of the occupation. And we were witness we went to witness the political, economic, social, and cultural reality of Palestinians under occupation. And the system of what is becoming more and more clear of apartheid reality in Palestine. And we will speak about it more. So that really is the framework of why the delegation and what we actually were able to accomplish. We may not be able to obviously cover everything that we did. It was very extensive, and it, but it is reflected. And again, I think that we're referring back to Martin Luther King in his remarks on April 4th, 1967. He concluded the speech by saying, we must be prepared to match actions with words by seeking every creative means of protest possible. And I would like to leave that for you when I get back to the whole question of what does that mean in terms of addressing the issue of Palestine and how we contest it how we debate it, and how we present it. Dr. Barker, are you next? <laughs> yes. All right, I'm going to get up second. So um, there are many people here I know, but many I don't know. So I just want to say hello. My name is Joanne Barker. I teach in American Indian Studies. I am a member of the Lenape people who are uh, indigenous to a territory that the United States now calls New England. So our traditional borders included what are now New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, a little sliver of Connecticut, and the state of Delaware. And as a result of all kinds of fraud and military violence, we went through uh, seven different removals formally um, under the provisions of 17 different ratified treaties. Um, and our final removal, uh, uh, in violation of the last treaty that we had signed with the United States, 
promised us um, our own territory and what at that time was called Indian Territory. We were not removed into our own territory. We were moved into the territory of another tribe, um, as were two other indigenous nations who were then placed under what they called the jurisdictional authority of the Cherokee Nation. Through two Supreme Court decisions in the early 1900s, uh, we were made dependent um, and, uh, and under part of citizenship of the Cherokee Nation, we were stripped of all of our rights to self-determination. When the Cherokee agreed to allot the reservation in the early 1900s, uh, we were forced to go through allotment as well. So our lands, what was left of them by then, went into private property, into trust status, and by the 1930s, um, Lenape people in Oklahoma virtually had no lands left. So why do I talk about that? Well, um, I've been talking to Dr. Rabob for <laughs> several years now about um, the question of Palestine in relationship to American Indian communities here in the United States and First Nation people in Canada. And had, you know, I, I study the law and politics, and so I know the UN conventions and all of this stuff and it's a very you know it's very intellectual I can rap with the best of them about Geneva Conventions and human rights and what counts as torture and what doesn't and, uh, but it's quite another thing to go right and to see for yourself and to do the research for yourself and I think if you're going to um, uh, quote unquote take a side in any political debate you should talk to the people who are implicated in it so um, it, I had tried to go on an earlier delegation and wasn't able to, and it just kind of logistically worked out this time. And one of the things that struck me um, the most with the people we met, it's kind of a, a sensibility that's very different with American Indian communities, who uh, would prefer people to stay away for the most part. <laughs> uh, most of the Palestinian people, and I mean on all sides of the political spectrum, that said this over and over again, tell people in America to come and see for themselves, right? Come and see for yourself. Don't listen to the media, don't listen to your government, don't listen to the political parties, don't listen to the leaders in the UN, don't listen to the leaders of Palestine, or of Israel, or of any other country. Come and see for yourself. And I was really struck by how open that invitation was and how generous people were with us with the information that they were willing to talk to us about, including rather painful experiences um, uh, of folks who had served time in prison and who had been tortured and children, right, as children. So um, we wanted to start, that, that's kind of why I went. Um, and, and what I was immediately struck by. Uh, the importance of seeing it for yourself. So most of you know that on January 12th, uh, we issued a, a public statement about um, not detention, we were not legally detained, but we were held at the border uh, terminal between Jordan and Palestine for close to 11 hours. Uh, four of us cleared um, with travel visas through sort of this final, there's like five or six checkpoints within the border terminal. <laughs> they look at your, your passports over and over and over again. So we were cleared to sort of that fourth hurdle before the last one. Um, at any time you cross, right, one of those, those screenings, you can't return and go back. So four of us were cleared, three of us were held back, and uh, Rabab felt responsible, since she was sort of our, our leader, <laughs> to stay back with the other three. But I think that was a very difficult decision for her, and I'll let her tell you about that. But she risks, right, as Palestinian, being not only denied entry, but denied entry forever. So her decision to stay with the other three who were, who were interrogated was, was quite serious and worried the rest of us. So Jaime and myself and Razmia, um, who's an alumni here, 
we waited in the baggage claim area for 11 hours <laughs> staring at luggage. We showed you the picture earlier. That was what I looked at for almost 11 hours. Uh, we were not allowed to return back. If we exited the building, we ran the risk of not being allowed back in. We didn't know whether or not we should leave and go to the hotel with everyone's luggage. What if these other individuals are not allowed to go through and then we have all their stuff? I mean, it, you know, logistically it's kind of a nightmare. But it's also, um, you know, the reality was that over that period of time, uh, the folks who were held back were interrogated um, on four separate occasions and asked everything from uh, what their scholarly research was about to what their academic networks were, who were they colleagues with, who were their friends, um, who their institutional affiliations were, uh, what kinds of classes did they teach? What kind of research did they intend to do while they were traveling? Had they signed recent petitions at all about Israel? Had they written or said anything publicly in criticism of Israeli policy? Two, uh, two women of, of the four were forced to sign on to their email accounts in front of a security officer on their computer. One had to demand twice to log out of her email before she was allowed to leave the room. So they were trying to gain unlimited access, right, to her contact lists. Um, we had taken laptops and cell phones with us uh, but they were repeatedly out. Why don't you have your cell phone with you? What are you afraid we're going to see on your phone? Uh, they wanted, um, yeah, they wanted it all. So both of those individuals subsequently have, have um, deleted those email accounts, right, and created new ones. But we all know, thanks to Snowden, that's kind of formalities in, the, in these days and age. Uh, one, one of us, uh, Shablan, who's a, a woman from Turkey, and it does work on violence against women living under colonial regimes. She does a lot of work on the Kurdish in Turkey. And she was told she shouldn't study that while she's in Palestine. Why isn't she going to one of the Arab countries where it really, where it really happens? Um, and uh, Junaid Rana, who is Pakistani, uh, they did not believe that he was not um, Palestinian. They kept speaking to him in Arabic. It was just a really bizarre um, series of interrogations. So for the rest of us sitting in baggage claim, I think it was about the seventh hour, I decided that a provision against board and torture ought to be included in the Geneva <laughs> Convention. Because they really do just sit you there, and you're not allowed to do anything. The set, internet access doesn't work, you can't make phone calls, really you don't want to bring your phone out, but you're clearly being watched and it's very uncomfortable to watch them sort of randomly, sort, randomly, quote unquote, search the luggage of people who are going through. I would say 95% of the luggage that was searched belonged to women in, in traditional right, uh, dress. Um, and they would do things like hold their underwear up and shake it out as though they're, you know, looking for devices or whatever. I mean, just all this kind of humiliation, right? And it's really, um, that, that kind of remained the theme for the whole time we were there. The boredom, the randomness, and, and the intentional humiliation. So you have checkpoints everywhere you go. You have uh, Israeli-only roads where, you know, people Everybody else is not allowed on it. You have random curfews, closures, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. You have uh, traffic in the West Bank, um, major intersections that have no stoplights, no signals, nobody directing traffic. So citizens direct traffic, children are playing in the street. It took us, what was it, like almost two hours to go go 20 minutes because it was so congested. Um, the lack of support uh, around infrastructure is just overwhelming. So, you know, you go to work and you have to, for, for a 20 minute walk, you have to plan five, six hours 
You have to get at the checkpoint at 3 or 4 in the morning and stand in line until it opens up and hope you get through and get to work in time. Hope they don't turn you back and say today you're not allowed to go through. So it's just non-stop all the time. Um, it's part of a structure of security that's uh, where a lot of things are done in the name of, of national security. So in Kalkilia, in Lid, in Balata, uh, we heard a number of stories from, you know, not, oh, somebody in the neighborhood once happened. This was mothers, this was fathers, this was an uncle, this was a daughter, this was a son who died at a checkpoint that randomly closed. There's no medical services open beyond 2 p.m., so if you have a heart attack or a stroke or you are an expectant mother and you are about to give birth, you have no medical access within the refugee camp or within um, the occupied territory. You have to wait for the checkpoint to open so you can get to a hospital. And it, um, it, it causes death. And it reminded me a lot of stories um, of folks in reservation communities here in the U.S. where um, the withdrawal or denial of ambulatory care or fire, you know, prevention or, um, not that we want more cops on reservations, but uh, causes and results in an increase in accidental death. Um, so things that could be fixed can't be fixed because you can't get it get to care. Uh, um, in Beersheba, which is near um, the Bedouin communities that we vi visited, one of the main streets on one side of the street is um, a mosque, one of hundreds of mosques that have been closed um, in Israel and turned into public buildings or bars or, you know, whatever, museums. This particular one had been turned into a, some kind of cultural center, was it? Yeah, where they had a weekly wine tasting. Um, Palestinians were not allowed into this place that they considered sacred, right, that was now used for, for these social events. Um, on the other side of the street <laughs> is the Israeli Southern Command, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's a converted building, high-tech security, right? Um, cameras everywhere, uh, and that's where the um, bombs are happening into Gaza and East Lebanon these days, over the last week. Um, so uh, one of the days we met with um, a scholar from Hebrew University. She came and met with us in, in the West Bank. And she told us uh, about the uh, detentions, the situation there with the rests. And I should say that the police, in the name of security, they have this law that allows them to do what's called administrative detention. It can last up to six months. It's renewable indefinitely. And they never have to formally charge you they, and they can deny you any kind of visitation. So you can't see your family, and you can't see any legal counsel unless they decide it's okay. And this administrative detention is being used with children as young as 12. <coughs> and so um, in the last month, I believe it was, the report came out uh, through the uh, Defense of Children International in Palestine and 183 kids have, have been administratively detained. And then what they do to confuse the community and ability to investigate and represent and demand and all of that is that they keep transferring them around between facilities. And it's not civil facilities, it's military facilities. So these are military detentions. And the kids are um, crammed in two by three meter spaces up to 17 at a time. They're made to stand or squat for six to eight hours, sometimes overnight. They're not given food or water. They're forced to stand in their own urine and feces. Um, and then the next morning, they're thrown before a judge. They can go before a judge, uh, at what was the highest number of times? Like half a dozen different times over several months before they even hear what the charges are. 
Um, and this is the daily life uh, of these kids. Um, I, I'm sort of supposed to outline this, the situation with security, and I'll, I'll close with um, a, another story that Nadira told us, which is um, about two young girls who, in March of 2013, uh, were walking to school. Um, they were in second and third grade. And uh, IDF soldiers were standing at the intersection. They were walking down the street from home and then crossing the street to go to school. And the soldier stopped one of the girls and made her dance on one foot while slapping herself in the face in order to cross the street and go to school. She was crying. She was really upset. She couldn't quite do it. Her older brother uh, had already was in the area, I don't know if he'd already crossed the street or was just standing nearby, but he came and tried to intervene. So the soldier um, made him stand on the corner and scream, scream several times, fuck Palestine, before they were allowed to go to school. Nadira, who's, who teaches law, uh, attempted to file a complaint. So she called the local captain um, of that area the police, and his response was, well, nobody was hurt, were they? So, yeah. Every day. Every day. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, uh, first, uh, before I even thank you, I want to um, acknowledge that we are meeting here on stolen indigenous lands, and we need to acknowledge that and uh, get permission from the people of these lands to be able to meet and to talk. This was very important in Palestine as well. Uh, I, my name is Rawa Abdul Hadi. I'm a professor here in the College of Ethnic Studies and Race and Resistance Studies, Islam. And uh, I, I'm building a program called AMID, Arab and Muslim Ethnicity and Diasporas Initiative. And uh, uh, this, uh, we're, we actually have, the minor has been approved by the college, so now we're going to go up to the committees. And uh, basically, we really mean faculty, because this is it. One person, faculty, for a program, doesn't make sense. But uh, we're very excited about that. But I'm not uh, here to talk about this. We can talk about that afterwards. But uh, this delegation has been one of the, my dream. I've been trying to uh, get a delegation uh, by uh, indigenous people and people of color to go to Palestine. And I think most of my colleagues know that I'm always trying to accost them in the hallways and say, when are you going to go with me? When are you available? <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'm really hoping that we will be able to have more delegations. Of course, there is a question, and we can have discussion about this. What does it mean to do this kind of political solidarity tourism? I mean, there is all these questions that we've had. We discuss them among ourselves, and we discuss them with, with people we've met with. Uh, but uh, with, with this particular delegation, I should say that uh, this was not um, solidarity light. This, not, that was, this was not solidar pre-solidarity 101. This was much deeper, much uh, um, serious, critical delegation that really we've had conversations. We had a lot of critical conversations. This is the way we're doing it, actually, we're passing around what we're going to cover and so on. So I just want to say that um, I want to mention the other things that we will be talking about. We want to talk about political prisoners. We want to talk more about the land and the, the, the cultural uh, violence and so on. We want to talk about labor and political economy and neoliberalism. We do want to share with you uh, what we had, the, the things that transpired with academic and research centers, uh, cultural uh, groups, and uh, also, um, here, well, we've mentioned some of the human rights, they probably will come up. And uh, so we will try to cover as much, yeah, and I mentioned academic and, uh, and research centers. And we'll try to cover as much as we can. We're not going to be able to cover everything. And we're very happy to talk some more. We're very happy to speak elsewhere and have these conversations. Uh, what we did this time with the delegation, uh, many of you probably know that I organized a previous delegation of indigenous and women of color feminist delegation. Um, the most famous name in that delegation was Angela Davis, but was Chandra Mohanty. But Beverly Shaftal was yet a whole bunch of them. It was 11 of us in 2011. 
this and it was it was really a good delegation. But I think this time, what we were able to do is we divided our time. Half of the time we spent in the West Bank, and half of the time in the four eight areas. And it was five days here, five days there. So it wasn't going to Palestinians under Israeli rule, like who are Israeli citizens, token visit. We did not just go one time to Haifa or one time to Nazareth and then stop. We actually did half of the time here and half of the time there. Uh, I, can we have the? Oh, this is the. Can we have the bigger map and maybe stop? The bigger just, map. I just want to like just just show on the map so people can. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, no, the one, other one, the first yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. This one. Okay, so this one. Okay. But it's possible uh, to make it bigger? I don't know. Can you follow my pen? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So we yeah, are in Amman. Oh. And then go. Okay, we are in Amman, Jordan. And one of the things that I wanted to mention is why is it that we were also interrogated and treated badly? Israel has a policy, and I believe that it is deliberate and premeditated policy to make everybody's life who crosses to Israel or the Palestinian areas from Jordan hell. Because they want to get people to land in Tel Aviv, here, the airport, Ben Gurion airport. They do not like people to come through Jordan. Even Jordan, which has a peace treaty with Israel, is not supposed to be benefiting financially from people landing in, air, in, the, in the Jordanian airport. However, we make it a point, and people who know me know that with the past delegation as well, we go, when we cross, we cross the way Palestinians cross. We're not going to exercise the American passport privilege and land in Tel Aviv and act like tourists if we really want to experience what's going on. So we landed in Jordan. So this is every time you experience this. So for instance, if you leave from Tel Aviv, if you fly out from Tel Aviv, let's say to New York, there is a flight that arrives and leaves in the afternoon, arrives in Newark the following morning or you know, 11 hour flight, you don't pay exit tax. But if you leave from the West Bank to Jordan across the LMB bridge, you pay $150 each. It's a tax that you have to pay $150, shekels. $150, shekels. I'm sorry, like about $50. This is a tax that you have to pay in order for you to be able to cross. Let me talk a little bit more about it. So you land in Jordan before the interrogation. You take a um, taxi or a bus or whatever to the Jordanian side of, side of the bridge. So you, la you stop there at the Jordanian side. It's called King Hussein Bridge. When you cross, it changes the name. It becomes LMB Bridge. Israel does not recognize King Hussein who was their great partner in the peace treaty and who was on the CIA payroll until 1976. And this is not conspiracy, this is well-known fact. They call it Allenby Bridge. Based on the Allenby, General Allenby, who was one of the generals of the British mandate of the colonial uh, country that was ruling Palestine. So that's the first thing you see, okay? And then there's a big sign that says, welcome to Israel. Actually, this is the West Bank, okay? The, the official borders are here between Jordan and Israel, which is, King uh, Sheikh Hussein Bridge, that's the official border. This is not supposed to be a border. This is where Palestinians cross back and forth because this used to be called the West Bank and this is called the East Bank when Jordan used to rule both parts before Israel occupied the area in 1967 along with, with Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and uh, Sinai from Egypt. Okay. So you go on a, on a transportation, you, you land here. Then you get on a bus or a car, any, another kind of transportation, you cross. This is very little, it's not actually, they call it the River Jordan, but there is really barely any water, but people use it for baptism. It, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice site, but really, no water. People would not drown. But you cross and you pay another transportation. Then you cross to the other side. You land at the Israeli side. You still haven't seen that, but this is supposed to be Palestinian areas, Palestinian authority. You get to the other side. Here is where you land and you and you and then the bags are taken away from you and Israeli security get you, whisk you, and then you go through, uh, you know, that body, the, the machines that, that check you and so on. And then they said some people they have to go on the side. And actually, Junaid was taken aside and he he and Maryam and Shablan were asked to sit uh, on the side. This is the first time, okay. And then if you clear that, still you're not you're not in there. You're not you haven't entered. Then you go to a big hall and that's where you wait. It's supposed to be the VIP. This is because we are American passport holders. This is the VIP. This is not for the Palestinians. This is for the privileged people, right? This is where we were held. And we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. Everybody here was really, really upset because we were held. This was the longest. But I, I think, and I've uh, shared this with, uh, with, a, with a few people that uh, in 2011, uh, I, um, I, had, uh, I was going to go visit anyway. And I, it, my mother was very sick, and I arrived 
three days after she passed. And the last day, the third day of, uh, you know, pe people usually hold condolences for three days. You know, like the first three days are really important. Everybody comes to um, give condolences. And this was the third day. And neither me nor my sister were there for my mother to be washed, to be buried. You know, like the two daughters, we weren't there. It was my sister, you know, they were like sisters, mm -hmm. but it wasn't her daughters. And so I was really anxious to get, so we left very, very early. We were there at the bridge, but before 8 a.m., before it opens, in order for us to be able to get there. So I wouldn't get delayed. So I will be there to stand up and take, accept condolences for the <coughs> last day of my mother's, you know, uh, other condolences. <coughs> Five or six hours we were held, for no reason. And I even text my brother, and my brother said to me, just show them the announcement of the, of, the, of the death in the newspaper. I showed them. They were practicing, and this is what they do. They sent first a very young person who's just been a recruit to ask you questions. Then they sent somebody else, and then a third person. Five people came and interviewed from different security agencies. The same question, what's your name? What's your mother's name? What's her phone number? And I'm like, she passed. And they, what's her phone number? I'm like, you can't call her. She's dead. She's buried. And it becomes, it's, it's like, it's very hard to talk about things of this sort and even to talk to them about, so you, you get to the point where you want to punch somebody. But it's very difficult because if you do something like this, you may never be, be allowed to, to get in again. And this is, people have stories after stories after stories. In the summer, there are children crying. There is no water, nothing. Once you get into this area, this is it. You cannot get access to anything. Even if you want to go to the toilet, somebody is going to stop and tell you, why are you going to the toilet? It's not allowed. It's, this is where we were held. The four passed, and then we were held. So after we clear, after the 11 hours, we left Amman 7.45 AM. We arrived in Nablus at 10.30 PM. We were supposed to have, we were invited to a dinner. We had meetings with people who were hosting us. And they really need to, needed to go somewhere. And actually, one of them, Sa'ad Abu Hijla, said, you know, I cannot meet you. I cannot meet you in the afternoon because they were, they were going, a whole bunch of people were receiving a body of a martyr who was buried in the Numbers Cemetery. We have a whole bunch, like thousands of Palestinians buried in something called the Numbers Cemetery because when, when like, say, somebody uh, gets killed in an in a, in a armed thing or even just, just dies, they, what they do under Israeli control, they put them in the cemetery. They, they bury them, every, everybody there, and they just give them a number. And they hold the bodies. Some bodies are held for 30 years, 40 years, many years. This guy was held for 12 years. So his family is insisting they want to be able to bury the bones. I mean, they're, you know, the bones. They want to just give, make him rest in peace, basically. And so he said to us, I I'm, I'm really need to go because we have to go on the prayers, the evening prayers, about 6 or 7 in the evening. And we said, just come meet us and go. We did not make it because we didn't arrive until 10.30 at night. But to get out, then we have to take another transportation from outside of the Israeli thing to the Palestinian side. Now the Palestinian Authority side, okay, with a huge flag. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and we, so we arrived there. And then we have to take other transportation from this big place, could they call it al Alamein, to whichever city you want to go to. All these, so nobody actually, nobody travels unless they really have to. Because it costs too much money, it takes too much time. It's something that we were talking about, there is Palestinians go into chronic waiting. You're waiting, you're always waiting. You're waiting in the checkpoint. You're waiting for, for, for the, to, to clear. The Columbia checkpoint that uh, uh, the Professor Barker talked about. This is the checkpoint that, below, that is in area C. This is between Ramallah and Jerusalem. Here's Ramallah, where is Ramallah? Ramallah is here and Jerusalem is here. It takes 15 minutes. It takes 15 minutes even, I used to drive it much faster than this. Okay, not really, not really, no, no, not really speeding, just normal, because you can, because, no, no, because Israeli police are always standing there to give tickets, so you can't actually speed, because this is one of the ways to like encourage, you know, and uh, keep, uh, put money in the, in, the, in the economy and so on. So 15 minutes, and the reason that there is, it's crazy, it's like took us two hours. We're on the bus, waiting on the bus. We were going to go to Ramallah to attend a concert by them, which is the hip hop uh, rap group um, that, that is based in Lud. And they were performing in Ramallah in the, in the, palace, uh, the, of, the palace of Culture. It took two hours because, because there is nobody who was controlling it. There is no, the, they, the, the Israelis control the space. But they would not, they don't have any traffic lights. They won't let the Palestinians navigate traffic. So it is a no man's land. So there are little kids telling the taxis, drive from here, go from there, like, you know, just passing their time and so on. 
two hours, and this is this is one of the ways to make people's life hell. And I'm, I'm convinced. I'm convinced this is a deliberate policy to not let people go and visit. Mm -hmm. If you want to go visit as tourists to Israel, no problem. But if you want to go, even as a tourist, through Jordan, through the way Palestinians go through, it's and actually one of the, the interrogators, she was interrogating me, interrogating me while other people were held in other rooms. The three people were held in other rooms, and I was alone. She comes to me, she said, why are you taking them? I said, they're coming to visit me. They're my colleagues. We, I'm, I live, I'm from here. I'm you, I have US uh, citizenship, but I'm from here. I, I'm going to visit my family, and they're coming. She says, who's your family? I gave her all the names I have already, a piece of paper prepared with copies in case they ask all the time. Then they say, we have it, we have it. Every time they say, you have Mac Hawiya, do you have an ID? I said, I used to have an ID, I don't have it anymore. And they say, and I get out the number to give them, they say, we have it. Okay, so if you have it, why are you asking me all the time if you have an ID? <laughs> they all, every single time, it, the same thing happens, okay? So I'm like, you go on remote control, you know, when they, when they, uh, when they do that. And then, and so then she said to me, so why? Why are you coming? People come, a lot of people come to Israel and come on tourism and so on. I said, yes, they do. What's so special? about this, I said, they're my colleagues. We're actually going to meet with academic institutions. We're interested, and some of you may already know that we are very much interested in collaboration. We're very much interested in team teaching, student exchange, faculty exchange. We know a lot of our students, and some of them I see here, for instance, they like to go to study at Birzeit University in the summer, but then they come back, their courses do not get transferred right away because there is no agreement <coughs> between Birzeit University and San Francisco State to give them credit for it. So there is, it becomes really complicated. So we were trying to kind of see how we can get more collaboration and get more people to go back and forth and so on. And she said, no, people come all the time. I said, this is different. People are not going to, you know. But this is one of the things that they do. It is really to, and for Palestinians, especially Palestinian Americans, mm -hmm. Make it so difficult that you say, okay, I'm never going to come back again. And this is not an accidental thing. I, I want to emphasize that this is a deliberate policy. Because as we will hear also, from instance, when we talk to people in Jerusalem, including Professor Nadir Rachel who came from Hebrew University, or uh, Zakaria Aude, who's the head of the Jerusalem Civic Coalition, there is an, an or the people, Mahmoud Jadda and Ali Jadda and Yaqub Aude, all the people who took us on tours in the, in the Jerusalem. There is, an, there is, Israel wants to live in, lower the number of Palestinians in Jerusalem to 8%. It's now 38% of Jerusalem, of East Jerusalem. They want to lower it to 8%. Mm -hmm. So they want to try any possible ways. And I can tell you, my brother lived in Jerusalem for 17 years, and he still doesn't have a Jerusalem ID. He still doesn't have Jerusalem ID. Every single time he has to have a permit to go to Jerusalem. Because they want to make sure that they are emptying Jerusalem of people in order for them to bring folks from Brooklyn, or maybe from San Francisco, or whatever, to live in, in their place. I mean, this is a very, very deliberate policy. So this is one of the things that, 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 that were happening. So anyway, so we went, so we arrived in Nablus. We could not do anything that evening. The next day, we went to Jerusalem, spent, and then we can talk more about that. We went to, uh, the following day, we went to Bethlehem and Hebron. Then we went to, uh, oh yeah, and then we went to Kalkwilia, which is right here. To, uh, through where the wall is, the, uh, the upper side wall, is actually surrounding the whole village. It's the whole village, and there is one gate that opens, uh, that closes at 7 in the evening, and if you don't have an ID, you cannot go through that gate. And I'm not going to like paint images in your mind of what this may remind you of in terms of the his history of humanity, the tragic history of humanity, but think about that. And then we went to uh, Umm al-Fahim, where we met with Sheikh Raed Salah, which uh, some of our friends in Amcha initiative from Santa Cruz, that ha an initiative that has been discredited by everybody, uh, has continued being the pit bull that actually works up hysteria and so on, says that he's a terrorist. Actually, he's an Israeli citizen. He has Israeli citizenship. He, he travels fine and so on. He's not, he's not in jail in Israel. And if he were actually accused of quote unquote terrorism in Israel, he would have been in jail. But he's the head of the Islamic movement. And so we met with him in Umm al-Fahim. Umm al-Fahim is one of the major huge concentration of Palestinians inside Israel, Palestinian Israelis. And in 1976, something big happened at that time. Palestinians organized something called the Day of the Land. The Day of the Land, some people will know, this is March 30th, 1976. Palestinians, it's because there is the, the confiscation of land continues. Mm -hmm. There is confiscation of land in the West Bank and in the Nakab, here, Be Sheba, this is what Joanne was talking about, which is actually 30 kilometers from Dimona, which is the Israeli nuclear reactor, which in the 80s, when Mordechai Vanunu, who was an Israeli uh, technician working there, uh, talked, spoke, he went to Australia and then he spoke and then they basically kidnapped him and they put him in prison, he's not allowed to say anything. He said that Israel had 200 nuclear web bombs. 
back in the 80s. Okay, so now, you know, if you hear Netanyahu's speech two days ago at APAC, he's talking about the danger of Iran developing water to develop nuclear capacities that may produce a bomb. Okay, that's not allowed for Iran, but Israel already has 200 nuclear. This is, this is, we went to, okay. So then we, so Umm al-Fahim, in Umm al-Fahim and other places, six Palestinians were shot and killed by Israel. And this is, to, they were protesting the, the, the takeover, more takeover of the land. And uh, one of the things I'll just mention it now is about the whole question of, of houses, that Palestinians don't get permits to build homes. You're not allowed to build homes. They wait and wait and wait, whether they are in, in areas under Israeli uh, control in the, West, in the West Bank, Area C is under, the West Bank is divided into Area A, B, or C. Area A is where the Palestinian Authority controls. It's the cities, the big cities, Nablus, uh, Jenin, Ramallah, uh, Betahem, Hebrew, half of Hebrew, okay? And this is where the Palestinian Authority controls the population, but Israel controls the security, which means Israeli forces, Israeli defense, forces, the military can come every single night, raid and take whoever they want. You know, this is, so Palestinians don't really have sovereignty there. Area B is the area where there is joint coordination. Israel is again uh, responsible for security. And area C, Israel is completely responsible for the roads and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So if Palestinians apply for a permit, let's say in Jerusalem, or in anywhere, anywhere of these areas here, or inside Israel, or in the Nakab, where we, we, we met with the Bedouins, they don't get permits. So sometimes people say, you know what, we're going to build. They build because they need to expand. So then the Israeli uh, court order comes down that they have to demolish the home. OK, this is not enough. They make the Palestinian who built his or her home pay for the demolishing of the home including the cost of the helicopters, the police helicopters that come to um, uh, monitor what's going on, including the police on horses. You pay for destroying the home that you've built with your sweat and blood and your children. And this happened because sometimes and sometimes Palestinians up to do it because it costs less. So it's like maybe it costs $200,000 to demolish it if the Israeli military does it. It will cost 150000 for the Palestinian to demolish. So they say $50,000 if it's called saving. So this happens all the time. So this is why Day of the Lamb becomes really important. That's Umm al-Fahim. We went to Nazareth, uh, and we can talk more about that. We went to Haifa, okay? And then we went to Haifa, we met in Mad al-Karmel. This is a very big research scholarly center of Palestinian scholars in Israeli universities. And we met with Professor Ismail al nashir who teaches here at Bilborian University uh, there. We met with a man named Abu al-Yasar, Mahmoud Mi'ar. He actually used to run for the Knesset. He's a former Knesset, which is Israeli parliament member. Uh, on, uh, you know, the um, Arab uh, seats and so on. And he took us around and he kind of like gave us a historical um, tour of uh, Haifa. And then we, uh, we with the, the, okay, so this is here. Then we went to Yaffa and Lod, and uh, Joanne was talking about that, and I'm not going to uh, discuss, but we, you know. And then, colloquially, uh, I just should say that both the woman who gave us the, uh, the presentation about the wall in Colquilia, and the man who took us on the tour in Lid. She is Suhad, uh, Suhad Hashim Shreem, and he is Khalil Abu Shahadeh. Both of them told us how the walls that were built caused the death of their family members. She told us, she was telling us about the wall, and she said that how the ambulance couldn't get there in time because of the walls and so on, her mother died. She was having a heart attack and that. He told us about his grandfather, who also, there is a wall, and this is, uh, look, this inside Israel. You know, it's not it's supposed to, it's here. They don't call it because it's like, it's supposed to be Yafa look right here somewhere. Okay. And uh, the man is sort of like, yes, comes to yeah. But, uh, but uh, so he told us about his grandfather who the ambulance came and the ambulance guy told him that if it wasn't for the wall, if we were able to go, and the wall is built because there is a Jewish neighborhood and there is a Palestinian neighborhood in Lod. And so uh, the Jewish neighborhood insisted on building a big, big wall to keep the Palestinian riffraffs to, from polluting their environment. So they cannot move, they cannot go. So the ambulance took a very long time to go by the wall, the guy, the grandfather died. I do know that one of our colleagues actually here from Chicago, Samir Ode, he was 42 years old, and he took his two children, he hasn't been to Palestine for 24 years, he lives in Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, took his two children, to Palestine, and there were three buses that went to meet him because his mother was very sick. He wanted to see her before she died. 
He arrived. The next day, he opens the window and he says to the kids, come and see how, how the, the mint smells really nice. I'm going to make you mint tea. And so on. he goes, ah, you know, he was having a heart attack. They called the ambulance, Jerusalem. They live very five minutes away from Hadassah Hospital, which is the biggest hospital in Jerusalem. It took the ambulance half an hour to get there. By the time it got there, he had died. He was 42 years old. And actually, his son was there visiting his family, and he joined us on, on the trip. So this stuff happens all the time. You know, and I, yeah, I can also tell you my own, from my own person, even the way my father didn't actually make it because the ambulance never got to him. He died uh, and under curfew and of the invasion of 2002. We also, uh, so, you, so there is stories everywhere. We went in, in, in uh, Lidr, in the, and then we went here. We were spent time in Ramallah. We were received by the Palestinian Legislative Council. They actually did a formal session for us, the members of the Palestinian Legislative of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, we met with cultural people, art centers, and so on. And I'm going to stop in terms of all the stuff that we did here, hear the longer report. Um, yes, I'm stuck. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We did a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. I think that uh, the most striking reflection of reality there is the expression that was given to us, and the presentation that was given to us by Professor Madea, who is a professor at uh, Hebrew University. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she, of course, uh, is one of the few uh, Arab uh, professors in Hebrew University, and within that framework uh, has had to deal with the isolation and the difficulties of being able to represent uh, the issue of the Palestinian reality. But I remember that the most striking thing that she described for us was that the Palestinians live within a fishbowl. A fishbowl, imagine. Put that in your mind. A fishbowl in which everything is controlled and governed, and you really have no control over your mobility or your planning or your ability to travel or your ability to determine long time planning. This was also articulated by the business representatives that we met with, who, you know, as a business person, you need to project and plan. Well, when your situation is not controlled by yourself and everything is governed by whether the Israelis would allow goods to come in at a certain time, whether they allow technology and the latest technology being available, that affects economic development and planning. But uh, the, 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 the emblem and the symbolism of a fishbowl is something that we saw throughout our trip and it's hard for us here to envision what that means because with all, with all the difficulties and all the political realities we have here, it doesn't quite measure up to that reality there. And the only real comparison to it was the reality of South Africa. And if you think about South Africa, this is the reality that the Palestinians are living under now. And that, in actuality, the South Africans say that the reality in Palestine is worse than they even experience. And one of the things that is worse is that this, with all the brutality of South Africa, nothing measures to the amount of force and violence that Israel has imposed on the Palestinians, whether it's the bombing of Gaza or the bombings within the West Bank. The measure of, of, of retribution, the measure of military might, not quite the same level I don't remember ever reading that the Israelis used fighter jets to attack you mean the South Africa? in South Africa. That in South Africa, I don't remember ever reading where the South African Air Force was used to bomb Soweto. Now, of course, they did many horrendous things. But I don't remember that, and that is a reality that occurs throughout. Now. <laughs> <laughs> if you first remember, time, I don't remember that. First time that no, no, I, no, I, I, no, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I, I don't think we should compare. No, I'm not comparing. I'm not, I'm not trying. I think the difference, um, one of the differences is that Israel is trying to evict the Palestinians. Yes, let me, and, you know, I'm leading. <laughs> That's what I want to okay. lead to. The reality is, and, 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 and everything we're discussing today can be a co-discussion by itself. And 
as historical frameworks. And the reality is that the, 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 what's occurring in Palestine is what occurred here with the taking of the land of Mexico, with the, take, the destruction of the indigenous people and their land and their, and their culture, the expropriation of